Spoilers, but longer. What's up, guys? I'm Gopon here, and here we are to do a breakdown slash. I was gonna say live reaction review, but breakdown and review and analysis of the sp 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 spoilers for chapter one. I keep saying 100. At the start. Why am I saying 100? 266 of Jujutsu Kaisen, which is known as the decisive battle in the uninhabited demon infested Jinjuku, part 37. 37. That is so great. Big boy. Now, how long was the Shibuya incident? Did the Kalei Games not have unique chapter titles either? Am I tweaking? I think no. They were legit just called Colony. Yeah, so, so they didn't have unique chapter So, man. Hmm. Kind of getting to me. My apologies once again. I am not at my regular recording location, so there will be a bit of an echo. I do not have my current recording equipment. And even then, I need to figure out how to make sure that sounds better too, so the audio will be horrific. I'm so sorry, but I do want to get this out because I am very, very excited. I like this chapter a whole lot, and that's why I'm going to be yapping about it for quite a bit. So let's not waste any more time, and let's hop right into it. Editing me. Are you ready? Three, two, one. Go. What's up, guys? That guy with a pencil here. Fun fact, I do happen to have it on me and keep it on me at all times. And another fun fact. For the longest time, if you were to ask me personally what I thought of the deuteragonist known as Megami Fushiguro, I would look at you and shrug. Literally just be like, not in the sense that like I particularly dislike the character, but not in the sense that I particularly like the character. Megami is one of the few characters, I definitely would say the few deuteragonists, who I just don't really have the most complicated opinion on. Like notably, especially for a series like JJK, where I have my nuanced thoughts about a lot of the cast, and Megami's always been someone who's danced that line between, hmm, hmm. Mm. Like nothing, po nothing extremely positive, nothing extremely negative, but nothing like exactly neutral. So it's more so mundane. It's like how most people feel about background characters. I kind of feel that way about Megami, which is crazy because he's literally the deuteragonist of the manga, and also like responsible in a way for like the whole story <laughs> because of the whole Sugata figure thing. They didn't be saved, bada bing, bada boom. So like he is a major catalyst of the story, but I've always felt mostly neutral about it. It's why. I was more so, and you can double check this. This is the beauty of having a long history of viewing on the channel. You can go check when I did the Megan review or the when he first happened the cover. I wasn't so shocked and crazy because, oh no, Megan got taken over. I was like, oh wow, Sukuna has a new body. He's free of you. Like my brain immediately leapt to Sukuna, who a character at the time I also didn't really have the highest opinion of. I really just leapt completely. Megami has always sort of been just there. Not in a bad way, not in a good way. However, I thought that was just going to get worse. And specifically, once he got taken over, I kind of viewed Megami as a sort of lost cause. And I low-key even wanted him to be a lost cause. Especially before Gojo fell, I was really looking into the tragedy of Megami Fushiguro as like what that would be. And ultimately, the tragedy of Megami Fushiguro would feed into the tragedy of Yuji Tadori and feed into an old, 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 old interview of Gege, it feels so old, I think it's like three, four years past, where asked about the nature of our main cast and crew, of our female lead, our main character, and our new dragonist, and possibly Gojo, I forget if Gojo was included in that interview, but essentially, Gege said, either they all die or one lives. So regardless, my brain was for the longest time locked in on the idea of Megumi Fujiguro being a part of Yuji Tadori's tragedy, as ultimately, JJK, no matter how you may feel about it on a micro scale, on a macro scale, is the story of Yuji Tadori. That's why chapter 265 is one of my favorite chapters in the series, it's why it's become, or becoming, um, one of everybody else's favorite chapters in the series, because it truly is the culmination of Yuji Tadori's journey so far. With that being said, that sort of naturally had me almost desensitized to the character of Megan Fushiguro as a whole. Thusly, when we open up, finally getting to hear him speak as himself for the first time in well over a year, because the Gojo vs. Sugata fight started over a year ago at this point. And I think that like it started all the way back in May-ish, May or June. We're now in August at the time we're recording. And remember, Megan was taken over well before that fight even started. He's taken over at like the 213s, 215s. He stopped being an autonomous character with like unique thoughts and interactions other than the occasional panel of him crying his eyes out for, I believe, over two years at this point, or at least nearly reaching two years. So these are the first 
words we've heard from Megami in an eternity. And it goes a little something like this. Enough. Now. I wished to create a world where Sumbuki wouldn't have to face unjust suffering. Even if I fail to make it, at the very least, as long as I'm around, I wanted to sustain such a vulnerable life where I could see it. I... Eating the meals I prepared out of habit, watching the laundry drying in the sun, and seeing Sunuki walk alongside someone like you, Itadori, in the setting sun. <laughs> what blissful moments. Enough now. You know, I'm a regular degular dude. <laughs> if you couldn't tell, I'm a regular degular dude who likes anime and manga. And if there's one thing I'll readily admit, I also kind of want to live a regular life. The idea of like extreme amounts of fame where you can't even do anything like that, I wouldn't mind it, but it's always been something that's been in the back of my mind. I kind of just wanted to grow up, enjoy life, experience it every way I can, and make sure the people I care about deeply, from my own family to some of my closest friends, are happy and healthy. But if they are not, I want to be there for them. That's always been my own mentality. And I think the disconnect for the longest time that I had with Megany until this chapter came from the idea that in fiction, I typically expect extraordinary characters, characters that are beyond the depths of what is reasonable. Sure, of course, I look for reflections of humanity with inside fiction, naturally, in my opinion, the more human your characters, even if they are literally the furthest thing from a human, Look at your Supermans, look at your technically Wonder Womans, look at your many like iconic, great scale, non-human characters. As long as I can see the spark of humanity in them, and as long as they're written with that spark of humanity in them, I tend to like them a whole lot. But I think I finally understand the Megami Fushiguro as one normal person to another. But unlike Megami Fushiguro, I was not born in a system that is innately chaotic. I was not born in a system that would innately cause extreme harm to those I love, extreme destruction to those I love. I was not born with the inherited technique of a clan that has over a thousand years of history. I was not born in a non-normal world like Megumi Fushiguro was. So seeing Megumi Fushiguro, a normal boy who wanted to be a normal boy, blessed or cursed with great power and by proxy a great responsibility, admit that in the end he just wanted to be normal? He just wanted to be there to experience the happiness and the joy of someone he genuinely cared for. There we go. Now I understand you, Megami Fushiguro. I don't know why it took me so long. <laughs> I feel like every single Megami fan out there is going to be like, Pencil Man, how are you this unemotionally intelligent? And hey, I, I've mentioned before, I have a degree. I have my master's, not in psychology and not in any literature analysis. So my apologies, I take my time with these things. And with that being the case, seeing Megami explain that recontextualizes and makes me appreciate a lot more of the character. And it makes me feel bad <laughs> for Megami, which is something I will wholeheartedly admit. I felt mentally, not emotionally. Now I feel it mentally and emotionally. Of course, I felt bad for Megami losing his bodily autonomy to the most evil, well, I don't know, Kenjaku's described as the evilest, evilest sorcerer in history, and I look, you believe it. But finally getting that connection, finally reaching across that gap, finally understanding Megami Fujiguro at his core, yeah, that helps. That helps a whole lot. And now it makes what happens and is hinted at later on in this chapter all the more cathartic now that I finally do care. I know there's one particular person who I talked to about their opinion on the manga, and they, for the longest time, have been the huge, most gargantuan Megami fan this side of existence. And I never understood them. I, I'm gonna, next time I chat with them, I'm gonna be like, I caught up, and then they're gonna be like, you're too late. <laughs> but with that being the case, what interests me just as much as Megami's own admittance of having enough. He's had enough of trying to do everything and only failing and, if anything, making it worse. Oh, one thing, one thing I do want to mention before I hop into Yuji's response, which I also find 
very, very interesting. And I really like it for the context of his character and how his superhuman nature plays into his lack of understanding until he was introduced to that non-normal world since he was born in the normal world, quote unquote. One thing that I think is going to haunt a certain faction of people, and it may literally even me as a person who did kind of want more from Gojo and Megumi's dynamic. I had a whole like long form discussion about this on someone's live uh, a few, I think either last week or two weeks ago. Gojo's not mentioned once by Megami. Not once. A parallel is mentioned. A parallel is in fact shown later on in the chapter. In fact, move, get out the way. But a parallel is shown later on in the chapter to Gojo, if you'll remember. Wait, it's better, it's better, it's better. A parallel is shown to Gojo later on. And maybe that's meant to be the case because Gojo's always sort of been the foundation for Megami, something to stand on and lead to. But I wouldn't be shocked if a certain group of people, myself included, would be a little bit disappointed that Gojo goes completely unmentioned here by Megami. Especially considering it does reveal that he was conscious. For the longest time, I may have pushed a certain idea that the reason Megami didn't even respond to Yuji and Yuji's Yuji and Yuta's soul poking was because he was under the effects of Unlimited Void. But considering it seems like he's entirely conscious enough to have a full-blown conversation, you may be able to argue that's Unlimited Void recovery or anything like that. The fact that he doesn't even mention the fact that his body was used and his technique was used to slaughter Sato and Gojo, his benefactor, the person who ended up taking over for Toji, the person who ended up allowing him and Samuki, really allowing the foundation for Samuki to not have to worry about living a life of complete and other subjugation of the Zenin clan, I, it hurts a little bit, even if I still understand it, because I don't think innately that the Megami and Gojo relationship was that deep. But I do see the hypothetical mispotential there. But once again, with the parallel made with Yuji later on in the chapter, him being the Gojo figure to the kid Megami, I, I can kind of see where Yuji's sliding in and technically taking that role and how Gojo acts as the underlying basis. If you get... But once again, considering how... Fine, Gage has been with inserting Gojo into flashbacks or metaphors or anything throughout the Shinjuku showdown well after his end. I actually am a little bit shocked that they had the restraint to just not do it here. Because it seems like such an easy layup. But with that address, Yuji's response is just as interesting. Grandpa's illness started with lung cancer. But he turned down the intense treatment with strong side effects early on. Since I'm physically strong... I don't really connect with the notion of rejecting such treatments or the concept of euthanasia I, that I occasionally hear about. It seems somewhat distant to me. I could endure it, but I imagine it must be very tough for the person going through it. However, after arriving at the Jujutsu High and going through many terrible experiences, thinking about the possibility of this, I started to understand and empathize with the decisions made by people who encounter unavoidable realities, like Grandpa. Now, I can only I can only partially relate to this. Not in the same way they did. Obviously, once again, your boy's a normal dude. But ever since I was young, I haven't necessarily struggled in some areas where other people have. Physically, I was strong for my age. Mentally, I was fine enough for me to the point where I didn't really struggle too much until I hit like algebra in middle school and then absolutely beat the taste of my mouth. And I hit geometry and it beat the taste of my mouth. And I hit pre-calc and it beat the taste of my mouth the hardest. Like there are times and once again, it feels weird. But once again, I always talk about the idea of introducing the human element that I can relate to and understand even if the situations are completely different. Yuji is referring to his natural superhuman nature and how that, once again, playing into the idea of strength being a path to isolation and misunderstanding, Yuji admits here that thanks to his superhuman strength, he was unable to understand why certain people would give up. If he could do it, why couldn't that? Of course, he never understood why he was superhumanly strong. He never got that, but he just knew he was. He had that strength innately, and thusly he could not understand why people wouldn't do it, especially if it would come to the benefit of their own lives. But... Now that Yuji has been placed within that realm, within a place where being superhuman just isn't enough, where being superhuman can still have you lose almost every fight, where being superhuman ultimately fails and pales in comparison to other superhumans, he finally understands that struggle. He finally understands what he could never understand. He was dragged down in a way that is unique to him. And once again, no underlying theme Oh, JJ. Well, not even underlying. I say it's a pretty overlying theme. Strength. 
Strength in JJK is one of, and the isolation that comes with it, is one of its most well laid out, well explored themes across multiple different characters. From Gojo, to Sukuna, to Toji, to Kashimo, to Yuji. So it's, man, it's fantastic. Once again, I've, especially as we've gotten towards the end of the Shinjuku showdown, I've been seeing a lot of many, 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 many people say, JJK's writing is trash. JJK's writing was never good. JJK's writing is this, JJK's writing is that. And here's the thing, right? I always have my own critiques for writing all the time. Just especially considering I'm a guy who's not qualified at all to critique writing. <laughs> Once again, no not, no degree or anything. But with that being the case, I do, I, I wonder, like, when you see things like this, how is this bad writing? And once again, I probably just need to do more research into the people and their critiques. I feel like, one, once again, the underlying message of strength and the isolation it brings and the idea of being dragged down, sometimes to your benefit, sometimes to your detriment, is a huge part of JJK. And it's so well explored through many different characters. Santoru Gojo was dragged down by Toji Fujiguro, who was dragged down by Santoru Gojo by proxy. Kashimo Hajime was dragged down by Ryoman Tsukuna, and Ryoman Tsukuna was dragged down by not just Yuji Tadori, not just Gojo Santoru, not just Yudo Kotsu, not just Maki Zen. Everybody dragged Tsukuna down to experience a state of weakness, a state of pity, and that has broadened all of their perspectives. And of course, Yuji himself was dragged down in a variety of different ways. I love that. And it's something unique to JJK and its writing structure, which is, at least in my opinion, fantastic. And like I mentioned, I can understand Yuji in that sense, where only after you finally experience struggle can you empathize with the struggle of other people. Once again, not in the sense that I'm some superhuman demigod or anything like that, but in the sense that I knew times without struggle and now I know them. But still, I'm just human. And so in the end is Yuji Tadori. And with that being the case, Yuji brings up another interesting human idea. For that reason, I can't tell you to continue living, Fushiguro. Have you ever seen somebody doing something that is innately self-destructive? I feel like everyone has, of course, to various degrees. And have you ever asked that person or told that person to do something to that person in order to get them to stop. And they look at you and you look at them and they either say no or they say yes and keep doing what they're doing. It's hard to accept the fact that there are people out there willing to destroy themselves for one reason or another, for reasons beyond comprehension. But at the same time, something especially, I think uh, everyone can understand this. I've seen kids understand it, but especially as I've gotten older, I understand it. People are people entirely of their own free will. It's the beauty of human nature and simultaneously one of its most ugly aspects in the terms of the ability to destroy oneself. And one of the biggest things, at least I've learned as I've gotten older, is that you can't change people. The phrase, I've heard it all my life, but once again, only as I've gotten older, I started to realize it. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. I never got the analogy, but now I do just like Yuji Tadori does here and now. After finally understanding what it means to be human and ultimately the weakness of humanity and understanding and being at the point where Megami was, where he was led to water, Yuji Tadori decided to drink, but he can't make Megami. Toto dragged Yuji to the water and Yuji decided to drink it and get back up with the hope of Nita, with the hope of Toto, with that determination, with that desire to keep moving forward. Yuji Tadori was able to drink. But even if Yuji Tadori slams Megami's head under the water, as long as he keeps his mouth closed, he won't drink. And Yuji ultimately realizes that, hey, that's okay. People are people. They can choose what they want to choose. It is not Yuji's place to determine what Megami's best interest is, what his best role is. And thusly, he's going to let him go. Megami Fushiguro, after the lost lives of many, many people, the trauma, the physical suffering, the bisection of certain characters, the main man who led the assault to save him has finally accepted that he doesn't want to be saved. And in that way, he's freed both himself and Megami by freeing himself of the burden of attempting to save Megami and free Megami of the burden of needing to be saved. But of course, there's a man who stands between these two, even as they have this discussion. The four-armed, four-eyed beast of a man with two mouths known as Ryoman Tsukuna, the king of curses, who immediately casts Hollow Wicker Basket. 
Now, once again, this is interesting how much of that prelude space was Yuji's domain versus how much of it wasn't Yuji's domain. Mm. I do think ultimately, though, it's kind of a state similar to what we saw back when Jogo first showed us domain expansions. The whole area, in fact, was Yuji's domain, just as the whole coffin of the Iron Mountain was, in fact, Jogo's domain. It's just that Yuji hadn't attacked yet. This area, this wide scale, this city is what Yuji's innate domain is manifested. The fragments of memory. And thusly, now that Yuji decided to activate it to its fullest, Sukun is forced to hollow basket where he wasn't before. And they revert back to their true selves, because I ultimately think a lot of last chapter was mostly symbolic. There's no point in this chapter where they like transform. We don't see we don't see um, Yuji Kuna like tear out, or we don't see True Form Sukuna tear out of Yuji Kuna and then slam his hands together to do Hollow Wicker Basket. We don't see Yuji Tadori redevelop the gauntlets, and we see his eyes flash back. But with that being the case, I think Yuji's domain is this world, and that's why Sukuna ultimately immediately reflects in the Hollow Wicker Basket in order to protect himself. Because remember, in spite of Sukuna's RCT output coming back, his full output isn't back. Not at all. And also, his soul is very loosely tethered to Megami's. It is like... Like, like he, he's holding on like this, essentially, to Megami's soul, making sure he can maintain his physical form. So the immediate hollow worker basket makes perfect sense for Sukuna. However, with that being the case, we do get to see that with both being ready for battle, both being met here, both ready to face each other down, they stand opposed, as they always have. Yuji Itadori, restored to his destroyed and damaged state, and Ryoman Sukuna, restored to his perfect physical state, but ultimately still in a state far weaker than what his physical form would imply. And we get an interesting point here by Sukuna. The method developed by Gojo Satoru of destroying and restoring the brain and resetting the burnt out curse technique is too risky to execute with my brain that's still affected by the unlimited void. So, Couple things here. Number one, chief amongst them, Gojo. He really, he like as a person who's been accused of glazing Sukuna recently, and eh, guilty as charged. But as, as a person who's been accused of glazing Sukuna recently, I do appreciate that Gojo Santo, the strongest source of the modern day, is still having impacts. Still, what many over a year? Not over a year. We're nearing a year. A year, a nearly a year after his end. The effects of just 10 seconds of exposure to a limited void, caused by 0.01 seconds of delay, by Sukuna's own foolish mistake, that devious fool, by deciding to have a little fun, it's still affecting him. It's still saving our cast and crew. Because he could have done it if he didn't have that brain damage. And that brain damage is a point of something. That's the number one thing I'm happy about. The, two, the second thing, a little bit mixed on, the method developed by Satoru Gojo, or Gojo Satoru, I don't know why I say Satoru Gojo and Gojo Satoru completely differently. It should I should either say Satoru Gojo or or what is it? Satoru Gojo or Gojo Satoru. I don't know why I switched back and forth. But with that being the case, I don't like and once again, these are actually spoilers. These are like the rough translations just imported into the chapter. I know the chapter looks kind of higher quality, but you can tell I'm I'm recorded in a weird way compared to what I usually record because the regular chapter didn't pop up yet. I have another live reaction, so I'm not sure how many of these translations are accurate to what. But once again, I'm talking about the spoilers, so I have my little rough spoiler thoughts here. I don't like that Sukuna said it was the method developed by Santa Gojo. Because a big point in chapter I want to say 2.30, I say, I want to say it's 2.30. A big point in chapter 2.30 or 2.31 is that Ryoman Tsukuna knew exactly what would happen. He knew, he explained everything of why Satsuki Gojo immediately experienced brain damage. Like he had predicted it, like he had seen it before, like his experience in the prime era. Maybe he had run into a sorcerer who shattered their domain before Sukuna, but they had high level RCT and they forcefully healed their brain. And Sukuna had beaten a previous sorcerer like that before, which is why he's so confident in doing it against Gojo. And ultimately he was able to identify, bro, you're just, you're just pushing too far. I've seen this all before. You're a fool. You're a fiend. You think I would have to learn from you? It once again emphasized Sukuna's prowess as the strongest sorcerer of all time. That's the main thing it did. It really showed Sukuna was big dog, big broski. 
But by having him say it was the method developed by Santo Gojo, and that's how you just tug it. Once again, it plays into the con artist side of sorcery, and it plays into Sukuna's still innate, extreme prowess. The fact that he saw it happen once or twice, I was like, oh, I know how to do that too. And just did it. It works. But I, I still prefer the world that I was living in, the delusional world that I was living in, where Sukuna didn't take it from Satoru Gojo. Satoru Gojo found the method that Sukuna already knew about, and Sukuna knew the drawbacks of. That would have been more interesting to me, but hey, it'd be like that, wouldn't it be like that? It just wouldn't be like that. The other thing, I do like the idea that Sukuna may have been able to do something more devious, more diabolical, if he hadn't made that mistake. Once again, a lot of the Shinjuku showdown is Sukuna's arrogance and his foolishness catching up to him. He would not be in this situation if he played the game just a little bit better. It'd be like that, but it'd be like that, especially when it'd be like that. But with that being the case, we do get to see that Hollow Worker Basket is getting buffed. In the sense that to domains that materialize mental, metal, metal, English, Med how do I say this? Mental constructs. Hollow Worker Basket and Civil Domains exhibit weaker output. The time until the guaranteed hit technique within the domain affects itself will eventually be overpowered. However, Sukuna compensates for its output by continuing to form hand signs even after activating Hollow Worker Basket. It allows him to continue fighting without being overpowered by the domain. So, this is an indirect buff for Hollow Worker Basket. Even though technically we have seen this before, Back when Hollow Worker Mask was getting a whole bunch of slander, it was the idea that you have to do this. And of course, there are many characters in the verse who could just fight with their feet and still be absolutely dominant. You could tie both of Sato and Goto's hands behind his back and he'd still be whooping behind of 99.9% of the verse. But it seemed like such an inferior way to defend yourself against the means if you had to consistently hold this. But Reggie, all the way back in the Negami fight, revealed that you can maintain Hollow Worker Mask and let go. But... People weren't sure if that was just an art mistake and ultimately Hollow Worker Basket was booty meat, but no, it reveals that Hollow Worker Basket is like Symbol Domain. You can move after using it, but ultimately, unless you keep refreshing it, possibly keep doing this over and over again, eventually it will get eaten away at by a domain. So if you do this, you may have five, ten seconds before the domain shirt it just devours Hollow Worker Basket and then you need to re-up it or you die, <laughs> essentially, because you get hit by the shirt. So, Hollow Worker Basket getting a buff, it doesn't do much for most characters, I'll readily admit, but for a character like Kashimo, it opens doors. Especially CT Kashimo, it opens doors that were closed before. If you don't know what I'm talking about, it opens doors that were closed before. So, like, the universe versus Kashimo matchup, through this, indirectly just got from fuel. Because one of the biggest ways that the universe versus Kashimo matchup was always decided was the idea that, oh, well, Kashimo tries to use Hollow Worker Basket and he can't fight back because he has to seal his hands away. What's he going to do? Kick you to the death? <laughs> and, and while, hey, you know, maybe maybe someone out there who was a Kashimo Blazer believed that was actually possible. But now you could do it so that when Yuta opens domain, Kashimo Hollow Worker Baskets fights a little bit, refreshes the Hollow Worker Basket, fights a little bit. And with his high speed, his speed that transcends humanity, you make some sort of scaling arguments, bada bing, bada boom. Yuta versus Kashimo is actually a real proper fight we can discuss now because Hollow Worker Basket is an actual real domain counter. Is it truly concrete? Mm, the bet, the bet. Once again, I'll see once the full translations come out and especially once the officials come out, I'll see what happens there. However, of course, we dive into the actual battle between Sasuru Gojo, oh, not Sasuru Gojo, Ryo Mitsuka and Yuji Itadori. The swans fly away. Once again, showing that there is life inside this domain, which is interesting, but no human life. It really is just Yuji and Tsukuna. And we see the two go to work on each other. Now, one thing I will admit, I do like that Yuji finally uses the gauntlets for more than just defense and regular punching. Because, like, he's had these sharp-ended gauntlets this entire time, and this is the first time he, like, blocks one of Tsukuna's knees. Or no, he catches it. He catches Tsukuna's kick and then jabs Tsukuna in the thigh with the, shockingly enough, dull-looking blades that are on the edge of his elbows. Neat. I like that. I wish the gauntlets were used way more. <laughs> And I'm going to talk about the gauntlets in a little bit because they're part of a massive reveal later on this chapter, which is neat, but also concerning. But with that being the case, we see Yuji ultimately latch onto Sukuna and begin to roll around him. He's really trying to keep hammering home the damage. Because sure, Sukuna is currently resisting the effects of the domain by holding Hollow Wicker Basket. Oh, this one thing I do want to complain about a little bit though, even though I get it. We keep giving him his arms back just to take them away. 
I know he dominates Yuji if he has all four hands. I know, I know it's too unfair, but still, why? Why? Why can't he just have all four hands? Bro? I want to see. The, I'm, I'm, I'll be real. You know what I want to see? I want to see a run back of the Grasshopper Curse versus Yuji. Four arms versus two arms, though. Where is it? Give it to me. We'll never get it. <laughs> because Yuji would automatically lose that fight. But still, we see Yuji latch on to Sukuna and ultimately keep applying pressure. Because sure, his domain is not able to immediately affect Yuji, which is likely his curse technique of being imbued in the domain. He's not going to be able to immediately insta-sure hit dismantle Sukuna. But instead, what he's doing is still applying soul punches. Now, I will admit it's weird in moments like this, like right here, why is he not cleaving him? Or just or soul dismantling him. We know you can use your innate technique while it's imbued in the domain. We see Suka do it. I'm not some mistake, am I? No, because we see even if Suka was a bad example, right? We see Gojo do it. He uses the limitless while clashing with his domain, which is imbued with the limitless. So like we we know you can fight. And same thing with Yuta, almost every domain. We see you can still use your curse techniques when your curse techniques are imbued into the domain. So why Yuji doesn't do it here, it does feel a little bit contrived, does feel a little bit weird, but once again, we gotta have some tension, so it doesn't happen. But with it being the case, we see that while Yuji is extremely powerful and able to do certain things around, Sukuna still does seemingly have the upper hand, swirling around, kicking Yuji, and then slobber knocking him down into the ground. And we see Yuji goes absolutely rolling. Oh yeah. One thing that I do like is that Sukuna still has supremacy. Once again, I think this is, it's half for the plot, half for the Sukuna fans. The idea that Sukuna still reigns supreme, even when facing Yuji Tadori in his own domain, after Sukuna is so much physically weaker from all the damage that Yuji's done that he has been able to restore through the many black flashes Sukuna has hit, I think it's purposeful. Once again, showing that Sukuna, even when he loses, he's not eclipsed. He's not surpassed. Ultimately, Sukuna's pinnacle, his path to sorcery to some way, and his natural birth of the perfect form for sorcery, it is all still supreme. Yuji has not surpassed that. Yuji has not reached that. He may have the same potential, maybe eventually, but ultimately Sukuna still is severely the strongest. And we see that Sukuna actually finds himself enjoying himself in a weird twisted way, as he says, <laughs> I'm surprised myself. Surprised at how furious I've become when I'm looked down to for treating me with such contemptuous pity. I'm thrilled at the thought of making someone other than you make amends for this. Once again, I've long since said that subconsciously, Sukuna's acknowledged Yuji for a while now. Internally, he's acknowledged Yuji for a while now. Of course, of course, of course, he's still yet to tell Yuji Tadori his name. He's yet to acknowledge him in that way. But mentally, physically, psychologically, subconsciously, Roman Tsukuna has acknowledged and somewhat accepted Yuji Tadori in a fundamental way. And the thing I appreciate the most about this is the idea that Tsukuna, once he was dragged down, once he was put in a scenario where someone could actually like reach out to him and see him on a human level, he feels so much real, actual, and genuine rage. Not displeasure, not malice, not anything. No, fury. I've become furious at the fact that someone like you thinks they can talk down to someone like me. Once again, the idea of those being dragged down, those who are at the top being dragged down, those who were born an exception because of their strength being dragged down and how they react to another one dragging them down. How they react to ultimately their humanity, not just being questioned and proven, but tested. And seeing Sukuna be a bit insecure about it ultimately and not liking it, that being the first thing really in the series to bring a genuine real life rage out of him, beautiful, especially from the one person he never acknowledged. But on top of that, what I do like is that Sukuna is confirming that he's 100% continuing the motif of what he mentioned at the end of 265. Oh no, someone else is going to pay for making me feel this way. Yuji Tadori, I will make you watch. After I shatter your domain, after I beat you to a pulp, after I make sure you are no longer a threat to me, I will grab you. I will drag you bit to bit, piece by piece, as I will take you over to Toto Aoi. 
and I tear his head off. I will dismember Hamakurusu limb by limb. I will find Maki Zenin, and I will take the souls of Katana and tear her to ribbons. Yuta Okotsu's body, I will eat it in front of your very eye. Like, legitimately, Sukuna feels that vitriolic anger towards Yuji so much that where before he was already going to have to slaughter everybody, it was much more like a Thanos in Infinity War versus a Thanos in Endgame. Thanos in Infinity War was very impartial to the work he had to do. He just saw it as that. Work. It's a job to be done. I will have to slaughter half the universe in order to save it. But as Thanos in Endgame says, no matter how much I like Thanos in Endgame less, there's one line that sticks with me because of how raw it is. Ultimately, the one thing that Thanos says in Endgame that sticks with me, what I'm going to do to your stubborn little planet, I'm going to enjoy it very, very much. Ryoman Sukuna is going to enjoy getting his get back. And that hits in just the right way. And honestly, but with that being the case, they continue to the depths of their battle. And we see a very important Distinction. Once again, continuing over the idea of, you know, accepting that you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make a drink. The child of Megami, the purest version of Megami, asks, huh? What's with that face? And we see Yuji Tadori, tears streaming. Nothing. It's just that it won't be as lively without you, Fushi girl. Yuji acknowledging the fact that Megami has to go. But, would you believe it? Once it's finally revealed that the time for Megami is up, that ultimately the utilitarianism has to kick in, Yuji Tadori has accepted that the world must come first, someone decides to wake up from their dream. Sukuna's foot sinks into the shadow, and he immediately goes to think, like, wait, what? How, how's this happening? With Maharaga destroyed and my Tenshao's technique rendered non-functional, this is Fushiguro Megami's. Did the soul that was sunk by the bath return to life due to the brat's dismantle? More than the dismantle, it was the conversation and Yuji's acceptance of Megami's loss that finally forced Megami to drink. It's like how someone who doesn't like a certain food will eat any food, including the one they don't like, if they have nothing else to eat. Megu Fushiguro realized that ultimately, in the end, being abandoned by Yuji Tadori, being left behind for the sake of the world, just wasn't what he wanted. And sure, he's lost, he's suffered, he's gone through immense struggle, pain, and torment. But even still, he wants to live. He wants to be free. And in the end, this is still a continuation of Megami, the kind boy who wanted to live a normal life. What is the thing that gets Megami to awaken from the shadow? Not Yuji explaining the whole idea that, oh, I accept that you want to go. It's the idea that Yuji admits, I'm going to be alone without you. But that's okay. That's what gets Megami to come back. A bond. It's, it's you know what? Funnily enough, I made a video talking about has Jujutsu Kaisen wants to do it. Has Jujutsu Kaisen on top called Disney? No. <laughs> this does, it's, it's so, it low key kind of is in the, in the best way possible though. The power of friendship. It was Yuji admitting that he was going to be alone and Megami's long-held desire to not be alone, to have connection, to be with someone like Itadori as a friend, uh, who knows. But with that being the case, that's what makes Megami up. The connection born of those two souls. And waking up isn't an immediate process, it's gradual. Just falling into the shadow, one foot deep, shows that Sukuna's control is slowly but surely waning. And we see that Yuji takes opportunity of this to immediately sock Sukuna in the mouth, in the face, in the nose, and send him flying backwards. You know, they're, they're exchanging blows now. No black flashes this chapter, no black flash class, which was unfortunate, but still. We see Yuji Tadori realize that Megami's woken up, realize that Megami's finally reached a hand out, realize that Megami has finally decided to drink the water that Yuji long led him to. And that brings the first smile on Yuji's face in a long, long time. They are the exception. And as Yuji charges in, ready to free Megami Fushiguro and take that hand that Megami has decided to finally outstretch, Yuji and Sukuna get to it. Sukuna refuses to go down quietly, because of course, he can't, he won't, he will not. And they end up in a field of snow, surrounded by straw. 
and both latch on to each other, one to one, grabbing each other's heads, and just start. It's so beautiful that in the end, what is going to conclude the battle between these two in particular? Who knows? There are things at the end of the chapter that imply there's probably going to be some sort of external interference. But what better way to conclude these two extremely powerful, extremely dangerous, extremely next level characters in this series full of mystical magical powers that break the laws of reality? It is but a fist fight. A fist fight of two men who despise each other, beating the souls out of each other simply because the other is there to oppose him. That, oh, it's so great, it's so great. I love it, I love it, I love it. I'm sorry. I'm just a fan of a good old fashioned slobber knocking. And we see that Tsukuda realizes that ultimately, <sighs> while he's blocking out the effects of the sure hit soul dismantle, he's not blocking out the effects of Yuji. At first, in the short spoiler discussion, I thought this meant soul damage, but I still think it means soul damage. Because, actually, maybe, because he's not healing. He's not healing himself here. So maybe it is. Maybe it's soul damage. But then again, Tsukuda can heal soul damage, which is weird. And his RCT output is back, which is weird. So I don't know. It's weird. But with that being the case, Tsukuda mentions, as expected, the brat's blows have effects that cannot be countered by reversal techniques. The hollow worker basket is falling apart. So yeah, ultimately... Even with Sukuna holding Hollow Wicker Basket, since Yuji's punches still have the soul barrier effect, and remember what the soul barrier attacking does, it lowers the output of Sukuna and weakens his potency. Hollow Wicker Basket and Sukuna's overall output is now falling to Yuji's domain and his output. Yuji's broken through that barrier, and now everything's going down. Sukuna has no other defenses, no other resorts. He realizes if he lets this go on any longer, all shall end. So he decides to risk it all. He sends out slashes far too soon. And they finally, after all this time, tear apart the gauntlet that was on Yuji Itadori. Now, I will readily admit, this is a little, this is a little bit nonsense. It leads to a cool reveal, don't get me wrong. It's a little bit nonsense though, because these gauntlets, one, have not even gotten a name. Let's be real, these gauntlets have not gotten a name drop or anything, nothing. So, they're crazy, stupid. And two, despite not having a name or anything and apparently having no related significance to Yuji consuming his blood manipulation siblings or anything like that, they finally break after like, what? The 99th dismantle? Go through and reread all of JJK from 238 up till now and see how many times Yuji is blocked or taking damage from dismantles. These gauntlets took no damage. And they're just gauntlet. Where did he get these from? Who made them? Did Yuta have these? Why wasn't Yuta wearing them? What were these made out of? Remember the last time we saw Yuta gauntlets, they shattered from one thin ice missile. You mean to tell me all the cleaves, all the dismantles Yuta's taken, and only now it's breaking? When Tsukuda's output should be in the literal garbage? What? What? Like, they only break the gauntlets, too. It doesn't even damage Yuji's hand. Why? I, I, don't, I don't know. I'm, I'm a little bit mixed about that. I really don't. Like, these gauntlets, considering how important they've been to Yuji's defense and how weirdly durable they are, despite being entirely unexplained, not the biggest fan of it. Not the biggest fan of their incorporation. It feels a little bit, a little bit contrived. But with that being the case, we see that Yuji realizes, oh no, I'm cooked. Because Sukuna has restored his technique. And with that being the case, he knows Gojo's path to doing it was used. And that means Ryo and Sukuna can open up his domain expansion. However, with that being the case, you see that Sukuna's nose is bleeding. I don't think it's from casting domain. I've seen some people say it's from casting domain. I think it is literally because Yuji punched him in the nose. But he does go for this. He goes for the unlimited void hand sign instead of the malevolent shrine hand sign. I don't think I'm doing this. I think it's like this. He doesn't go for this, and despite having the two hands to do it, which does imply that he's still scared of using the original brain mapping to do that, which I do think is neat. Once again, Gojo's, Gojo's after effects basically never ending is beautiful chef's kiss i love that but with it being the case he notices something strange yuji's hand his now freed left hand is missing two fingers now one of those fingers being gone makes sense because if you remember the pinky that sukuna tore off to transfer 16 of his fingers over to megami was taken off before yuji learned rct so that finger likely healed over scarred and he was never able to use it but a second finger is missing his ring finger Wait, what? Naturally, 
That implies that Rika and Yuta got access to Cleve and Dismantle through consuming Yuji, who was a living, breathing Sukuna Finger, if you'll remember. And that means the real final Sukuna Finger is still in play. Deep in the depths somewhere, the final finger is hidden. Now, there are a couple means of copium. Nobara, Nobara, Nobara. Nobara is the biggest point of copium here. However, this could be entirely non Nobar hype. This could just be the fact that you just plan to seal Sukuno right back in the original finger. But even still, I don't know. That seems a little bit, a little bit nutty, a little bit kooky. I wouldn't be shocked if Nobara really did come back here. And ultimately, though, if we go with the idea that one character dies or all of them die, or one character lives and all of them die, I forget. What I forget. Maybe it's an inverse of Gage's enemy. Maybe Megami, Yuji, and Nobara are all going to live, or maybe Yuji and Megami are going to die, and it's going to be Nobara's alive. Regardless, the final finger being in play is a neat twist. I will admit, I was not expecting it, and it does justify the Gauntlets in terms of hiding that fact from Sukuna. But I still wish the Gauntlets got a little bit more explanation. We'll talk about Nobara Kofi more in depth once the actual review comes out, because I've been yapping really, really long for a spoiler discussion. But of course, because these spoilers were better than normal, because they had the translations built in. But I hope you guys enjoyed this spoiler discussion. My apologies for all the echo chamber. I I want to say it'll be better by the time of the review, but depending on where I am when the actual chapter drops with full TCB translations, then uh, I may still end up sounding a little bit echo chambery. But it'd be like that. Would it be like that? Especially would it be like that? However, if you made it all the way to the end of this video, please do me a favor, if you will, leave leave King Fingers. King fingers, as in like chicken fingers, but instead of chicken, king fingers in the comment section down below. I mean, thank you so much for watching. Please remember to leave a like, share, comment, and subscribe. Make sure the only case you not miss out on any videos that come to the channel. Also, also I do have a page down below where you can support me for as little as one, can one, don't things like exclusive videos, early content, and more. You also become a member of the channel for as little as three dollars a month to get the same perks and more. So those perks include the live reaction to this very chapter, add free variations of all my videos, and become a twenty dollars patron, only twenty dollars member. You can order whatever video you want. Also, 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 you link to my Ko-Fi in the description down below. You can drop five beans for a short video, twenty five beans for a long video, or any beans at all. Any support is always greatly appreciated. Now, I'd like to thank you so much for watching once again, and I hope you guys have a wonderful day. This is Daddy of the Pencil, writing off. I'd like to give a thank you to our three dollar members: Zera, Greyhound, Eternal Flame, NMA, Real Rare, Red Wolf, four seven six five, Paris Arnold, Astro, and Brandon Payne. And I'd like to give a thank you to our five dollar patrons: Zombie Hunter, Sean, Midnight Lord twenty one, King, Meliodas, Kevin, and Carnacion, Josh Brown, and A plus A. And I'd like to give a thank you to our seven dollar members: Autumn, Mornings, Lazo, and Five. And I'd like to thank you to our $10 members, Robbie Uchia, Jay Warrior, and AZ Void. And I'd like to give a big old thank you to our $10 patrons, Michael Williamson, Waki Munoz, Waki Munoz, and Idem Okami. And I'd like to give a final gargantuan thank you to our $25 patron, Calvin Elder.